Tonight, Comedy Central proudly presents from the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the first annual Mark Twain Prize, celebrating the humor of Richard Pryor. From Washington, D.C., join us on stage at the Kennedy Center with special appearances by Richard Belzer, Ruth Brown, Morgan Freeman, Danny Glover, Chris Christopherson, Chris Rock, Damon Williams, and Robin Williams. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Whoopi Goldberg. talk a little bit about originals, okay? First editions, one of a kinds, because that's why we're here tonight. Richard Pryor is above all a one of a kind. So. <laughs> so it's right that he should get an award named after another original, Mark Twain, because they're both a little out there. No, truly, truly. Twain was a biting satirist taking on subjects few others could flay, cook, and lay out for your reading and listening pleasure. He said, suppose you were an idiot, and suppose you were a member of Congress. Ooh, but I repeat myself. <laughs> you know? And you get no argument from me on that one. He also said, profanity is better than flattery. I love that. <laughs> and I would be using some now, but they won't put it on the TV. <laughs> and this is my favorite. I know all about audiences. They believe everything you say, except when you're telling the truth. <laughs> but Richard, he always told the truth. He said shit other people only thought about. Black people, white people, didn't matter. He could take you places you only thought you had been. Richard did a sketch that I saw when I was a kid on television that was so deep and so true that at the end of it, there was no credit roll, there was no, oh, the show is over, nothing. What he did, and it just totally changed my life. He had a sketch, he's standing on a, on a stage, big afro, he's being backed up by a band. Camera comes over, all these kids waving their hands, and he's all done up like a Kiss character, all black leather, big <laughs> afro, and you can't quite hear what the music is, but you see him go like this every now and then, and then a couple of kids would disappear. <laughs> and then, again, he would go like this, and a couple more would disappear, till at the end of the sketch, they were all dead. And Richard's character stood there and gave this laugh that now, even now, my hair is standing up. He went, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> scared the poop out of me. <laughs> but nobody else had done it. Or the time when he did the opening with the white lady running in slow motion and he was running and then the Klan guy came up and shot him. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody was doing what he did. Now, one wonders what a meeting of Twain and Pryor would have been like. You know, well, it would have been great, I know, but we'll never really know. But for one thing I can tell you, Richard would tell you how he saw it, and you'd laugh and cry and make sounds you didn't know you could make. Not like, tee hee, -hee. not that. Not ha ha, like that, wah ha 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 ha. <laughs> Just where tears are running down your eyes. Take a look at Richard at the height of his genius. We come from the first people on the earth. Damon Williams, Chris Rock, and Robert Williams when the Mark Twain Prize continues.
welcome back to the first annual Mark Twain Prize. Ladies and gentlemen, Damon Wayans. Thank you. Good evening. Hope I'm funny. <laughs> like Michael Jordan defined the game of basketball, Richard Pryor defined the game of stand-up comedy and comedy itself. And if you haven't stole from Richard, then you're probably not that funny. <laughs> I remember one time seeing uh, Richard back in 1982 coming out the comedy store. And uh, you could tell he had just performed because the whole audience followed him outside. And I pushed my way up to the front of the crowd and I just stared at him. I was just staring at him hoping that some of his magic would like rub off on me. And I wanted to tell him that I wanted to be just like him except for the drug habit and the failed marriages and the temper and the guns. <laughs> but I didn't say it because that's not how I wanted to meet him, you know? I just walked away. And then 10 years later, I was performing at the comedy store myself, and I kept hearing this laughter coming from the back of the room, and it sounded like a wounded animal. <laughs> It sounded like, oh, 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 oh. and it, it was disturbing me. It threw me off because I thought somebody was like sodomizing a sheep in the back of the room. And so I got off stage early and I, and I went to the back of the room and people kept telling me, yo, Richard was there and he was laughing. And I was like, really? And so I went further to the back of the club and I saw this skinny man in a baseball cap smoking a cigarette. And he looked at me and he said, you're funny, man. You're a funny mother <laughs> He said, all that stuff you're saying about your wife, man, that's funny. And I was like, yeah, Rich, but my wife hates it. He said, good. <laughs> that's how you know it's funny. <laughs> he said, she like diamonds? I said, yeah. He said, then she'll go to like your punchlines. <laughs> and then <laughs> he invited me and my wife over to his house for dinner. And I think this was wife number 16 or something. And <laughs> he practically did like a one-man show for me. And he's telling me about his trip to Africa and how he got chased by wild pigs and, and that he hung out and got high with a tribe of Africans. And then he got paranoid and thought they were going to put him in a pot and boil him. <laughs> and I mean, I must have laughed for like three hours straight until Richard got up and he said, all right, get the fuck out. <laughs> and I thought he was still cracking jokes, so I'm laughing, you know? And his wife leans over and she says, uh, Richard wants you to leave now. And I said, okay, well maybe that's the way geniuses say goodbye. And genius you are, Richard, and I still want to be just like you. Robin Williams and Chris Rock, plus Morgan Freeman, coming up. Saluting Richard Pryor, please welcome Morgan Freeman. Boy, well, there's a lot of people here today. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Mudbone. I'm Tupelo, Mississippi. You don't know me without you know a fella named Richard Pryor, right, Smart? Hey, you sitting up there. I'm happy to see you too, boy. Yeah, 
that means that reports about your death is greatly exaggerated. <laughs> you remember Tulum, don't you, boy? You know how he is, old nosy scoundrel. He asked me what I was going to be doing up here in Washington, D.C. Well, I told him I had to come here and talk to these peoples in your honor because he was getting his here reward, you know. <laughs> Tulum said, I thought he was dead. I said, no, he ain't dead, he tired. <laughs> Most are tired of paying taxes. <laughs> Boy, I said, look like the more he made, the more they took. <laughs> Tell you, he sent more of them damn IRS fellows to school than he did his own kids. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know what he said. He said, well, I ain't gonna use that kind of language up in here. <laughs> but he meant I ain't gonna work no more. And I see, in the business world, that's what you call tax evasiveness. <laughs> see? Remind me what my friend, Mr. Mark Twain, used to say. Say, he'd he rather see the taxidermist coming than the tax man. <laughs> oh, the taxidermist ain't going to take nothing but the skin. <laughs> yeah, I know Mark Twain. Met him when I was a little bitty boy. I remember I used to sit under the willow tree over there on, on, on Main Avenue and listen to him. He liked to tell stories. Yeah. Smoke cigars, tell stories, and spit. <laughs> well, that was his job. I'm pretty sure that was his job because that's all he did. <laughs> Boy, one off made a fortune. He ain't give me a nickel. But that's all right, because, you know, them stories he told me, you know, they kind of made life interesting. That's what you do, boy. You make life interesting. That's right. You know why? Because you funny. <laughs> Ain't it? Look at it. Sitting up there about to get this here. Preston did this award. <laughs> That's all right, Junior. You done good. I'm right proud of you. <laughs> Ain't we? <laughs> Richard, I hope I didn't do too bad on that. Thank you for letting me. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you probably one of the funniest young men in the country. Well, at least in this state. <laughs> well, in this city, anyway. At least on this street. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chris Rock. Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. You know, uh, earlier tonight, uh, Whoopi said, what would a meeting between Richard Pryor and Mark Twain be like? What would it be like? And I gave it some thought. I really gave it some thought. What would Pryor say to Twain? He'd probably say, I really enjoy your work. <laughs> and what would Mark Twain say to Richard Pryor? Probably say, nigga, pick up my bag. How <laughs> 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 ah, we dream. Now, when you talk about great comedy teams, people usually say Abbott and Costello or Martin and Lewis. You know, people usually don't say Pryor and Wilder. Now, I think that's because they never would build themselves, you know, they never build themselves as an act. But through four films, they had great chemistry. Richard Belzer, Chris Christopherson, Robin Williams, when we return.
Welcome back to the Mark Twain Prize. Now, in the 70s and early 80s, between the rise of the two great plagues, disco and AIDS, <laughs> Richard Pryor was at the center of a great stand-up revolution. In those years, he was, there was also a Mr. Behind the Scenes, a comics comic. It's a good, I love this guy. He's on homicide. He plays clubs and colleges all across the country. Please welcome Richard Belzer. <laughs> Richard Pryor, the two most beautiful words in comedy. You know, if Lenny Bruce and Jonathan Winters had a kid and he was black, <laughs> he would be Richard Pryor. I see Richard got the Abe Lincoln seat. <laughs> you must know some really important white people to get that seat, huh, Rich? The first time I met Richard uh, in person was uh, I was working at the Improv in New York City, the improvisation, and I ran over there to do uh, my set, as we say, and as I went into the club, the owner of the club, Bud Friedman, said, Richard, you'll have to wait because Richard Pryor is going on in front of you. I had to follow Richard Pryor. That's like saying, uh, Da Vinci's going to paint, and then you're going to paint. You say, Da Vinci's going to do that wall, and you're going to do the wall next to him. But uh, I, Richard actually stayed to watch my set, and I, I did not embarrass myself. I did okay, and I did pretty good. And he, and he asked to see me. I went over and I sat with him, and, and uh, he was very sweet to me. He was very accessible, and, and uh, just was very moved that he even wanted to talk to me. Years later, I saw him again at the Comedy Store in Los Angeles, and I was auditioning for The Tonight Show. And uh, I had gone on stage, and I, and I cleaned up my act. I took out all the expletives. I, Try to be as accessible to America as I could, and worked really milk toast and clean, and did my little set for the guy that was auditioning for the Tonight Show. I came off stage, and Richard was in the audience. He called me over. He said, "What was that? I didn't recognize you. That wasn't you, Richard." I said, "Well, I, I'm auditioning for the Tonight Show." He said, F "The Tonight Show." <laughs> mm. He said. <laughs> He said, you be yourself, Richard, and they'll come to you. And sure enough, 30 years later, I got the Tonight Show. <laughs> a TV comedy in the early 70s was basically a lot of Dean Martin's Golden Girls, who I slept with 11 of, and wall-to-wall <laughs> -wall Brady Bunch clones. And then Saturday Night Live came along in its first season, the Not Ready for Primetime players received a big credibility boost when Richard Guest hosted. One of the highlights of SNL's 20-something years is this piece. <laughs> if he ever did anything else, Richard would have earned his place in comedy simply by writing Blazing Saddles with Mel Brooks. <clears throat> now, one day, uh, I was walking down the street in Manhattan, and I bumped into Mel. He said, how do you do? How are you? I never ran for a bus. So I was walk slowly, jaunty jolly. <laughs> and I said, Mel, what are you working on? He said, I'm doing, I'm writing this Western with Richard Pryor. Richie, he called him Richie Pryor. He's a genius, he's brilliant, but the studio is afraid of him. <laughs> You know, had Warner Brothers had the balls to let him play the part of the sheriff, that great movie would have been perfect. <laughs> Among the many memorable scenes in Blazing Saddles, there are two that are almost all Richard. There is, of course, the famous bean-eating scene, but we felt that you didn't get a real sense of Richard's skill with dialogue watching cowpokes breaking wind, so... <laughs> instead, here is the classic, make that classic seduction scene with Cleavon Little and Madeline Kahn. Stay with us for Chris Christopherson, Danny Glover, and Robin Williams.
In addition to being funny, Richard Pryor basically wrote the field manual on misbehaving. If you could do it and it was fun, Richard did it. And I did it with him a few times myself. Often in Hawaii he did it, and often with his fellow No Goodnick and Rhodes Scholar, the man whose voice sounds like he has lived a thousand years, most of it at a party, my good friend Chris Christofferson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> funniest line that Richard wrote for that seduction scene in Blazing Saddles never made it to the movie theaters. After Madeline Kahn said, it's true, it's true, Richard's line was, stop, you're sucking on my arm. <laughs> <laughs> but they cut it. Richard grew up in Peoria in the 1940s. And, uh, Supposedly, it, it was it was a okay place to live if you weren't white. Richard said this meant they kept their Negroes off the streets. Sometimes people wonder where he got the background for all all the characters, like the one Morgan played earlier, and it's from real life. Richard was basically raised by his grandma, Marie Carter, and she ran the family business, which was a whorehouse. <laughs> and a bunch of bars on uh, Washington Street. So here's uh, to sing a song in tribute to those anonymous working girls who contributed so much to, to Richard's education as a comic and as a man, I guess. <laughs> Singing, if I can't sell it, I'll keep on sitting on it. <laughs> here's one of America's greatest rhythm and blues singers. Please welcome Ruth Brown. Now, I own a second-hand furniture store. And I think my prices are fair. Well, I did, until this real cheap guy walked in one day, saw this chair that he wanted to buy, but he wouldn't, claim the price was too high. So I looked him straight in his eye, and this was my reply. If I can't sell it, I'm gonna keep sitting on it. I sure ain't gonna give it away. Now, darling, if you want it, oh, baby, you got to buy it. And I mean just what I say. Now, how'd you like to find this? waiting at home for you every night. Only been used once or twice. <laughs> and it's still nice and tight. Oh! But if I can't sell it, I'm going to sit right down on it. I don't see the need to just give it away. Now look at this nice bottom. Ain't it easy on the eye? Guaranteed to support any weight or size. Oh, but if I can't sell it, I'm gonna keep sitting on it. I ain't about to give it away. You know, I have really had my fear of folks always coming around with their hands stuck out. Everybody wants something and don't nobody want to give up nothing. Now, if you want this, put your hand in your stash and bring me some cash. If you want something for free, go to the Salvation Army. Don't come looking at me. 
Now this is not St. Vincent de Paul's place. This is Ruth's place. Read my lips. No free trip. And if you came in here looking for a handout, oh darling, you are really in the wrong place. My advice to you, let the dough hit you when it dog bit you. Cause you get nothing around here for free. But some advice from me, and that is, I'm not giving away anything for free. If you see something up here that you want, tell you what you do, baby. Before you leave, I wanna tell you, baby, just turn around and show me the money. Show me some money. Show me some money. Danny Glover and Robin Williams still to come. Stay with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Danny Glover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I remember the first time I was introduced to, uh, to Richard. I had seen Richard before, a long time ago, in, in, at a place called the California Hotel in Oakland, in Oakland, California, down on San Pablo Street. And the California Hotel, it's where all the like players and, and all, all, the, all the night people come and everything else. And so we, we're sitting in there and the rich is coming and, and all the players and everybody come in, the hustlers, and they come in and sit down. And, and, you, and you, you don't want to cause any, you don't want to be a distraction at all. So you're sitting there and you want to wonder how they're going to react because how you're going to react is going to determine how they react. So if it's funny to them, then it's going to be funny to you. So Richard begins to talk about them. You hear a mump, little grumbling in the audience and everything else. And then finally, they started to laugh. It. So he made it all right for them to laugh, and it made it all right for everybody to enjoy it. But he was so, there's something, there's something so truthful about what he brings to us. When I, when I was asked on interviews, I mean, what, what did he bring to you? You're a dramatic actor. You're not a comedian. What, but what Richard, we're all part of Richard's legacy. We're all part of it, whether we're, we're a dramatic actor, whether we're a comedian, because his truth and what he gives in terms of his truth is so profound that it, it makes us want to give back our truth in some sort of way. And I want to thank him for that, because his truth, his truth, while I walk with his truth, we all walk with his truth. Yeah. You know, Throughout his career, he has had great fun with money-hungry evangelists. He did, <laughs> he did it many times in Car Wash, in Which Way Is Up, and, and never better than in Richard Pryor's special on NBC. You know, it comes to me in a dream, and I hate to bring these things to you in the church, but it comes to me in a dream. <laughs> that a lot of people complain from time to time. They say that we're having financial problems in the church, and that is true, we are having financial yeah, problems. Yeah, yeah. And that's because we're not getting the crossover bucks. <laughs> we're not getting the white folk money. <laughs> Most of our money comes from the minorities around the world. Although there are a lot of them, they don't have as much as one rich white person. <laughs> so what we're looking for, we're looking for the Billy Graham dollar. <laughs> we want the money, honey. <laughs> so we offered a little message to the white folks of not sending in money. We're not begging for the crippled children. <laughs> We're not begging for the orphans, the black orphans or Watts. We're not begging for them. 
No, and we're not begging for the black old folks home either. This money is to go to the BTAL, the Back to Africa Movement. Coke dealer. <laughs> Somebody did that. Somebody did them. What mother decided to sell Coke to the Amish? Was there Colo some Colombian guy going, no, man, serious. There's a market we haven't reached. No, oh, man, check it out. How did they know? I mean, that's like tits on a bull. Was there some little old lady quilting for 72 hours? It's like... And I get it, and I get it. And you tell me what now? What's an Amish drive-by shooting? Bam! Is dedicated to you because you taught me that it's possible. <laughs> this is the type of place. Look at it. It's true. Now, this is the type of place that I know there's little Irish ushers in the back going, "My God, he just had shit on the stage of the Kennedy." <laughs> I feel like I should bring out Pavarotti and Puff Daddy right now. <laughs> Your yeah, baby needs some back, some big ass boot. <laughs> but this is the type of place where they could give out the Nobel Prize. And man, if anybody ever deserved a Nobel Prize for comedy, your ass does. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> but here's the deal. Mark Twain said, that the secret source of humor is not joy, but sorrow. And that man up there is the evil Knievel of comedy. <laughs> Pain! This man, my God, man, you, the shit you put yourself through. Do you get air travel miles at Mount Sinai? <laughs> it's amazing, we talked about stuff like, after you had your first heart attack, you talked about being in the pool, drowning, and going, oh, 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 and your daughter going, that is so funny! <laughs> That is so funny! Remember when the Friars Club had a roast for you and I said, God damn, that's redundant, man. <laughs> Don't do that! This was literally the hottest man in show business. <laughs> Flaming down Sunset Boulevard. People going like, Bridget, give me a light. <laughs> Remember that thing when you talked about waking up in the ambulance and all? You're basically air in the ambulance. There's white people all around you in the ambulance, and there's Lawrence Welk music coming and go, oh shit, I died in winter, the wrong motherfucking heaven. <laughs> and goddamn, man, after the surgery, you're basically you're lying there in the recovery room in, a, in the top of ice, smoke coming off your ass, and the one guy comes up and goes, Yo, Richard, how about that last autograph? <laughs> you talked about that stuff. You pushed it. You broke all barriers. 
I know if Mark Twain meets you, he's gonna go, that nigga is a funny mother <laughs> Yes, sir, you had the power. Mm-hmm. You know you do. Got a feeling in my heart. Mm-hmm. Yes, it does have the power. Now, a lot of white people don't get used to this kind of preaching because I know it's usually somebody standing up there going, I feel good. But this music, oh, yes, you know. Man, you've been married so many times. Yes, indeed, and they, and they come back. They marry you again. Damn, you must be good. Yeah. Well, thank you, know it's true. You know you will not you say, I beg you say, yay! Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you shall fear no evil, because you're the funniest motherfucker in the valley. Thank you, sister, clapping away. The white people are gonna go, not yet. But the truth is, uh, you've always been possessed with the spirit of laughter. Because you've been burned, but you came back laughing your ass off. Can I get a witness? The comedy had you going. Yes, sir. Then it gets the 